Well, hello, everybody. I'm Christine. I am a grad graduate student at UTSA who's doing research at <laughs> Southwest Research in San Antonio. Um, and as my title says, I'm going to be talking about oxidation chemistry in Enceladus Ocean, as well as its implications on the habitability of the ocean. So when Cassini did its E21 flyby through the plume of Enceladus in 2015, it found all of the ingredients required for methanogenesis, this microbial reaction that converts carbon dioxide to methane by reducing it with molecular hydrogen. And it not only found all of these ingredients, but it found them in high enough concentrations for there to be a large chemical affinity for this reaction, or a large amount of chemical energy available if microbes were to use this reaction as an energy source. However, methanogenesis is just one of many possible reactions that microbes could be using. Um, I've compiled a list of eight such reactions here, but I'm sure you could think of more to add to this list. But you'll notice that the one thing that all of these reactions have in common is that they require an oxidant. So for methanogenesis, that's carbon dioxide. For these others, it's molecular oxygen, sulfate, and I've chosen gertite here, but any ferric oxyhydroxide you could reduce as a metabolism. And you'll notice that CO2 is detected in the plume. None of these other oxidants were. So if we want to figure out if there's energy available for other microbial reactions on Enceladus, then we're going to have to build a model of the ocean to try to constrain the concentrations of these oxidants. So how do we go about making such a model? Well, you've all seen this cross-section a billion times before, I'm sure, but we've got a rocky core, an ocean, and an ice shell. Um, this gives you an idea of the relative scales of these things. At the south polar region, we think that the ice shell is about 5 to 15 kilometers thick. So that's what we've got to work with here. Now, if we consider this cross-section from the top down, the first way that we could get oxidants in the ice is through radiolysis. So from when radiation from Saturn strikes the ice here, it can break the water molecules into hydrogen and oxygen. If we've got some kind of geologic activity overturning the ice, and in this case, at the South Pole of Enceladus, we have a plume depositing ice on top of the surface, then we can actually trap whatever O2 we make in the ice and transport it down into the ocean where it can be used by life. Another way we could get uh, O2 in the ocean is through radiolysis of ocean water directly when potassium-40 molecules decay and again break up that water into hydrogen and oxygen. And then once we have O2 in the ocean, it can either be used by life directly or it can react abiotically with things. Um, there's a whole slew of reductants you could consider. I'm choosing reduced iron and sulfide just because based on what we think Enceladus core is like, those are two reductants that are probably in high concentrations in the ocean could actually make an impact on whatever O2 concentration we have there. So taking the first piece of the puzzle here, looking at just the surface, how much O2 can we make in the ice and how much of it can get down into the ocean? Well, we have a couple of different things we know. So the two processes competing to make and remove O2 are radiolysis of water producing O2 and sputtering of the surface removing it. We also know how quickly, based on CD8 data in this Kempf et al. paper, we know how quickly ice is being deposited on top of the surface by the plume. And as it turns out, for all of those snowfall rates from the plume, they're much faster than the surface sputtering rate. So essentially, any O2 you make in the ice is actually going to get trapped and could potentially be used by life in the ocean. Now, we're going to make some assumptions to uh, move forward with our model here. The first assumption we're going to make is that we're dealing with a steady state system. So in essence, as quickly as you're depositing ice on top of the surface, it's melting at the very bottom there into the ocean. We're also going to assume that this rate of deposition, the steady state system, has been constant over time. And we're going to assume that Enceladus is four and a half billion years old. Now, of course, you can disagree with any of these things, all of these things. That's fine. But for our purposes, we just want a very limiting case. What is the maximum amount of O2 that we can get from this process? And we're going to stick with these assumptions for now. So once we make all these assumptions, we can actually calculate how much O2 builds up in the ocean over time. And for the highest snowfall rate reported in this Kempf paper, that's about 10 to the 16 moles of O2. But of course, if any of these assumptions are wrong, or if our plume history is variable, if the snowfall rate has been variable, anything like that, then we're just going to shift this curve over, and we're not going to get as much O2 in the ocean. So moving on to our second O2 production process, we have radiolysis of the ocean water. It turns out people have actually studied this for Earth's oceans and looked at how 
the uh, decay of potassium-40 produced O2, H2, as well as hydrogen peroxide in primordial ocean waters. And they've calculated the rates of production of these species. So if we assume that these rates are the same in Enceladus, but account for the different potassium-40 concentration, which we can get, then we can actually calculate how much O2 could theoretically be produced there. And again, assuming this has been happening for four and a half billion years, we get about one and a half times 10 to the 16 moles of O2. So pretty comparable to the ice shell delivery. If we actually compare the rates of production from these two different mechanisms here, we see that potassium-40 is more important during the first 1.2 giga years of Enceladus lifetime. After that, deposition from the ice shell and the plume becomes more important. And that's actually good news for us because potassium-40 is going to be decaying as long as Enceladus has liquid ocean, whereas we have no idea what the plume has actually been doing over the course of Enceladus' lifetime. So if the plume is much younger than we think, if it's only been there for a billion years or so, then we still have this other equally as important mechanism for producing O2 in our ocean. So now we put O2 into the ocean what happens to it. Again, I'm going to be assuming it's either going to react with reduced iron or sulfide, and that's going to deplete the amount of O2 we have available for life, but it's also going to produce ferric oxyhydroxides and sulfate, which are still oxidants that can be used by life, and we're in that list of reactions I showed you earlier. So to figure out how these things react with O2, how they're going to affect the concentration of O2, we have to look at the kinetics of the reaction. So here I've plotted the time constants of these reactions. And you can see that it looks like it's pretty fast. So an hour to a year, those are still very short time scales compared to the billions of years we're looking at. However, it's dependent on the iron concentration, the sulfide concentration. So if we really want to know how O2 is going to get affected by these reductants, we have to put some kind of constraint on the concentrations of these species. How do we do that? Well, I'm going to assume that the concentration of these reductants are controlled by some kind of mineral on the seafloor that's dissolving these reductants into the ocean. How do we decide which mineral? Well, we can look at which minerals are stable on the seafloor as a function of various parameters of the ocean. So in this case, I've chosen silica, which we don't really have a constraint on in the ocean, as well as H2, <laughs> which represents the oxidation state in the ocean. And the reason I've chosen H2 is because we have a constraint on this from this weight at all paper. So we can see that if we assume this H2 constraint is true, then depending on our silica concentration, we're either going to have siderite or minisotate as the stable molecule in the ocean, or mineral, not molecule. So now I'm going to fix my H2 concentration and let sulfide vary instead. We can see we've decided siderite and minisotate are definitely there. Those appear at the bottom of this plot too. And as we vary our silica concentration, we can see that either troilite is going to be controlling the sulfide concentration or pyrite is going to be controlling the sulfide concentration. So now we know which minerals we think are going to be there that are responsible for producing our reductants. We're going to do the same thing at pH 11. So again, another stability diagram. Our H2 constraint is a little bit different at pH 11. And this time, we have four different minerals that we think could be controlling the iron concentration. So once again, I'm going to now say we know the H2 concentration, that's fixed. We know these minerals are there, um, depending on how much silica you have. And I'm going to let sulfide vary again. You can see that once again, our four minerals appear here. And in this case, only pyrite is a sulfur-bearing mineral that could be producing sulfide in our ocean, again, depending on the silica concentration. So what do I do with all this? I have my minerals that I think are there. I know they're controlling the reductant concentrations. I can combine those with all of the models of Enceladus ocean chemistry that we have from Wade et al., Glein, Postberg, et cetera, and I can do a speciation calculation. And that's going to tell me how much, roughly, iron as well as sulfide total is in the ocean. So now, I still haven't touched silica. I've let that vary. But I have an upper and lower limit on the concentrations of these reductants in the ocean at pH 9 and pH 11. So if I then place my limits on this plot here, mm -hmm. we can see that for sulfide, it's still very fast, like somewhere between an hour, not even approaching a year. So this reaction is going to eat up O2 as soon as it gets into the ocean. For this guy, it's a little bit slower, just depends on, again, how much silica we have, as well as the pH. Um, that could react slightly slower. But overall, because we're considering timescales of billions and billions of years, 
that's still pretty fast. So that tells us that essentially O2, as soon as it gets into the ocean, is going to react with these reductants, and it's going to drive the concentration of O2 to steady state, which means that the production rate and the destruction rate of O2 is zero. And we can calculate that. So this is the steady state concentration of O2 in the ocean over time um, at pH 9 and pH 11. And we can see that it's very low, which makes sense because these reactions are reacting so quickly with it and eating it as soon as it gets into the ocean um, between like 10 to the negative 11, 10 to the negative 12 millimoles per kilogram of water. However, if we actually calculate the chemical affinity for these O2 consuming reactions, we can see that they're still pretty high. Um, as a reminder, methanogenesis, I said, was like 50 to 150 kilojoules per mole. These are much, much higher than that. And that's because even though our concentration of O2 is low, it's a very powerful oxidant. It's at like the top of the oxidant food chain. That's the one these microbes are going to go to first if it's available. So we're going to now use our steady state O2 concentration to calculate the steady state sulfate concentration. We can see that it's much higher than O2, up to 2 millimoles per kilogram of water, again, depending on silica and pH. But sulfate is not nearly as good of an oxidant as oxygen was. So our affinity is still lower. Um, but 50 to 70, 50 to 120, that's about the same as what methanogenesis was, which tells us maybe these are still just as important as that one. And once more, I'm going to use my O2 concentration to calculate the concentration of ferric oxyhydroxides over time. Um, that's higher still, up to 10 millimoles per kilogram of water. But because that's kind of the worst, the bottom of the food chain on the oxidant scale, we still don't have a whole lot of chemical affinity for that. So maybe there's none, maybe there's a little bit, but that's the worst one we have so far. So here is our list of metabolic reactions that microbes could be using and the amount of free energy available from these reactions. So again, we see with the exception of our iron here, these are all at least com comparable to methanogenesis, if not more. So that's good news, maybe. We have all sorts of reactions these microbes could be using. There's plenty of energy available in the ocean. We can build ecosystems. That's great. But maybe not, because just because there is a large amount of chemical energy available right now at four and a half billion years into Enceladus' lifetime, doesn't mean that there was always energy available. It doesn't mean that these could have sustained life over time. To figure that out, we need to look at power, energy over time. So I'm going to take my chemical affinities, and I'm going to divide them by the production rate of the limiting reactant in each reaction. When I do that, things change considerably. So methanogenesis is now the clear winner of all these reactions. These others are, I mean, a fraction of that. So maybe that's telling us that that's still the best one. That's the one we need to look at. That's the one the microbes are going to be using. However, I still haven't given you the full story because I've only considered a couple of oxidation processes. There's still plenty more ways we can get oxidants into the ocean that I'm still thinking about, one of which is hydrogen peroxide. So we know that for O2 to be produced radiolytically in the ice shell, the energy of the electrons is relatively low. They have to be making O2 right at the surface. And that's between like 10 eV to 400 eV electrons. If anything has a higher energy than that, it's going to penetrate deeper into the ice and produce hydrogen peroxide. And if we actually look at the energy spectrum for electrons at the south pole of Enceladus, we see that if we integrate over the energy to get the energy flux, then the energy flux of these high energy peroxide producing electrons is about six times higher than the low energy O2 producing electrons which means we should be getting about six times more peroxide than we do O2 in the ice. And that can either dissociate into O2 and hydrogen, or it can participate directly in reactions. Either way, it's a very significant source of oxidants that we have not considered yet. One final source of oxidants that I also have not yet thought about is the core. So this paper here looked at how much H2 could be produced radiolytically in the core and found up to 2 times 10 to the 18th moles. If we then assume that O2 is going to be about half of that, because that's usually roughly how radiolysis works, that tells us that the amount of O2 we could get in the core is on the order of still 10 to the 18th moles. And that's 100 times more than those other O2 creation processes I talked about earlier. Um, now, is all of that O2 going to be accessible to life? Is all of it going to get into the ocean? Probably not. But if even just 1% of that was, that's still 10 to the 16 moles, which means this would be just as important as those other O2 creation processes I told you about. And with that, I will take questions.
time for questions. Um, did you look at the acetogenesis reaction, perhaps? Uh, which one is that? CO2 and hydrogen to make acetate. No, but that's a good idea. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Uh, good presentation. Uh, Christine, is it known whether there is a mechanism for back reaction of oxidant and reductant produced by radiolysis and surface ice as it spends uh, millions of years making its way to the ocean? Uh, so for O2, no. And that's mainly because you're producing it in the top layer of surface ice and all the hydrogen leaves. So you just end up with O2 in the ice. For peroxide, that's something we're looking into. So we think it is possible because you're trapping all the H2 and O2. We think it's possible that it could be reacting with other things as it goes down. So you might not get that six times amount in the ocean. But that's all to be considered in the future. That was a delightful presentation. <laughs> I was, um, I'm wondering about the Earth because presumably some of these same uh, oxidant producing processes would have been happening on Earth early on. And have you explored that potential for that? And that because we can compare to the evolutionary history of the use of different oxidants by way of genomic data and so forth. Uh, I wish I knew anything about the Earth, because I would love to do that. And I feel like if we <laughs> knew whether these things were happening, that would tell us a lot about whether this is possible on these icy moons. I mean, the, um, the potassium-40 decay we're getting from people that have considered ocean water. So I think that is something we could do. I mean, I don't know how much we know about the composition of Earth's primordial oceans. I'm sure it's out there in the literature somewhere. So if you guys know, I'd love to talk to you about it. But I feel like you could definitely apply a lot of these things to that composition and see what happens. I'll follow up on that. I'm no expert on, on this sort of thing, but I, I know from my reading, it's uh, for the Earth, people love to talk about radiolysis creating hydrogen as, as a fuel for life. And of course, obviously, radiolysis, just like in your graph, it produces hydrogen and oxygen. And so I'm presuming within these, these concepts for the Earth, the Earth you know, deep biosphere, that kind of thing, is that the oxygen is taken up by rocks, and the hydrogen is then more free to to do what it is. So I could imagine uh, in your Enceladus picture that you have this oxygen production from the top, and then you have hydrogen production, if you, even from the same mechanism from below, because it will leak out from the from the rock from the porous rock core. Right. Yeah, and I think they actually in the um, the hydrogen paper where they announced they had detected it in the plume. I think they considered radiolysis in the core at least as a possible source just as they were discussing all of the different places that hydrogen could have come from. So 